Right. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex. I'm a fellow student of PYC 2603, Adulthood and Maturity. We're going to run through chapter one. And let's see how it goes. This comes directly from the textbook. I've summarized it and chucked it into a website with a few pictures and some things I found on Quizlet. I do hope it helps us prepare for the exam. There's our timetable for 2021. Assignment one is the first two chapters. It covers basic concepts of adult development and physical development and sexuality. So we're going to be doing basic concepts of adult development. Adulthood is divided into three stages because it can be over 50 years long. There's another point we'll look at in a moment. Okay, so early adulthood, 20 to 39, middle adulthood, 40 to 59, and late, 60 to death. Many African societies define ages 50 to 59 as old age because it is the time of reduced productivity and the end of reproduction. The World Health Organization also defines Africans over 50 years old because the struggle to survive is such a disadvantage, so people age faster. Let's look at the first question. Here we see the question is about why do we divide adulthood into substages? Okay, we know that the answer is definitely A, because it's right there in the textbook. Um, B, possibly true, but not relevant. C, true, but not relevant. D, true, possibly relevant. Okay, so from that you can work out the correct answer. Okay, so then there's some more questions, some of which are, are relevant to this and some of which aren't. Never mind, read them, see if you can guess the answer, look out for the answers while you're studying. Okay, there are four perspectives on age. First, chronological age by year. Second, psychological age, by the ability of the person, which is measured by the ability of the person to adjust and cope as compared to others of the same age. So we'll speak about someone having a psychological age of 15, even though they are 20, meaning they cannot cope with the challenges and responsibilities of your average 20 year old. Okay, social age, according to social norms and expectations. Biological age, age, according to physical well-being as compared to others of the same age. So if someone's very fit and eats very well and is blessed with good genes, they may have a biological age many years younger than their physical age. Additional concepts. Functional, functional age, the total ability of a person to function. Personal age, how old you feel. And the ageless self, the self feels like it does not age. So someone will say, why am I going into an old age home? I don't feel like an old person. Gerontologists divide aging into primary, which is typical, gradual, normal aging. Secondary, secondary aging is due to disease or stresses. And tertiary, end stage aging is just before a person dies. And that can happen at any chronological age. Four definitions to know. Gerontology, the study of old age and the aging person process from the word geriatric, gerontology. Gerontologist, a person that studies gerontology. Okay, geropsychology, the study of the psychology of aging, normal and abnormal psychological changes that occur in later stages of life. Geriatrics, medical specialization for older people. Okay, then 
demographics is an important part of this. Demographics is the statistical study of human populations. The most important trends are aging population, slowing population growth, migration. Okay, three kinds of migration. One, rural to urban. Two, a loss of skilled labor, or call, also called the brain drain, um, as skilled people move to where there's better pay. Three, illegal immigration of poorer and less skilled people over the borders. Okay. Lifespan, developmental psychology. This is the book's major perspective, and the major theorist of lifespan developmental psychology is Paul Baltes. The key principles of lifespan developmental psychology are lifelong development over the whole lifespan, multidimensional, dimensions being different ways of understanding things, so personality, cognition, social functioning, and more. Multi-directional. Direction here is better or worse, more or less. Okay. A there's a combination of gains and losses throughout life. There's plasticity as a key principle. People have the capacity to change throughout their lives. Cultural historical context. It all happens in context of society and history. Contextual. Contextual um, principles include biology, society, and the environment. Multidisciplinary. Lifespan developmental psychology draws on medical, psychological, sociological, um, academic fields, and more. Different forces shape development. Okay, we're going to come back to these again and again. So there are biological forces psychological forces and socio-cultural forces. Psychological forces include cognitive, emotional and personality characteristics that make it better or worse over time. Socio-cultural forces are interpersonal, societal and cultural. Life cycle forces may be any of the above that affect people at different stages and points in their life cycles. And these may be positive or negative. So life cycle forces is like a catch-all phrase for any of those other three. Those other three are the major concepts. Different influences shape development. Okay. So we have normative, there are three. We have normative age-graded influences. Here, Normative comes from stats, that statistical concept of a norm, a number you can use to measure what is going on statistically and apply to individuals within that group. So normative here means in accordance with statistical norms and what you would expect to happen, okay, according to age. So these experiences caused by the four forces above, biological, psychological, sociocultural and life cycle, okay? Um, so it's according to when statisticians and the culture usually expects the aging person to undergo them, biological, psychological, sociocultural, okay? The normative expectations of when all these things can occur has become broader over time and also happens more and more when people are older because people are living a lot longer and being a lot healthier in the old age. Normative history graded influences. This is a very fancy way of saying the effect of historical events that we expect to happen to everyone in your age group or social cohort. Okay, so students um, at high school, we expect to have problems going to school, problems getting educated, problems edu accessing education, okay, in that social cohort. Biological, the COVID-19 pandemic, we expect a 15% mortality for people age 80 and above and higher in some societies. 
and it's still coming in. Those statistics are still changing. Psychological, we expect loneliness and depression due to lockdown amongst many people. Uh, sociocultural, the entire lockdown process is a sociocultural effect, a force on people and their development. Non-normative influences. These are random influences that affect people outside of a social context as individuals, outside of the norms of what statisticians expect to happen to someone in your age group. This may be biological, struck by lightning, psychological, winning the lottery, sociocultural, accidentally becoming a famous meme, okay. which has happened to some people. All right, recurring questions about development. Nature versus nurture. Nature being genetics and biology, nurture being environment and experience. Okay, so all of these uh, questions or issues around development are multidimensional. You know, nature and nurture are not part of the same dimension, but they are also because there's a spectrum. So they are not only two different dimensions, but they're also part of the same dimension on a spectrum. Um, not only that, but they also interact, okay? Um, so it's quite difficult to tease them apart when actually studying real life people. So we've got nature versus nurture. Nurture being what happens to you. Nature being what you're given to begin with. Stability versus change. Okay. Continuity versus discontinuity. Meaning is change gradual or abrupt? Like, is it a continuous process of getting older and wrinklier and grayer? Or do things happen in sudden uh, dramatic changes, shifts from one stage to another? Quantitative versus qualitative. Quantitative is about changes in degree, quantity. So it's associated with continuity, walking more slowly. Qualitative is about changes in category, abrupt changes, discontinuous changes, such as ending up in a wheelchair and needing to adapt to that. Activity versus passivity, okay? To what extent are you creating your own change and making it happen? Or are you a passive um, subject who simply experiences things happening upon you? Universal versus context specific. Mechanistic versus orgasm, organismic versus interactionist. Okay, so we've got mechanistic. This is important. Mechanistic is a passive concept of issues affecting people during development. Okay, the person is passive. There are biological and environmental forces, nature acting on the person, nature and nurture. Development is continuous and it is therefore quantitative in the mechanistic understanding. Organismic, people develop according to personally created patterns. Okay, this is more like Maslow. Mechanistic is like behaviorism, organismic is humanistic, okay? Internally generated, meaning they have made choices and decisions and they have acted. So they have personal agency. They move from qualitative stage to new qualitative stage as they change their lives. These stages are usually seen as universal, although of course, some of them will be context specific. Okay, interactionist. Both genetics and environment and context interact in complex ways. People participate in their lives through reciprocal relations with the environment. Development is multidirectional and multidimensional. So this is like the social constructionist um, theories, okay? Key vocabulary and concepts in chapters one and two. Okay, this is more chapters one, actually, I need to change that. Um, Okay, there's the same kind of thing, just revising and also running ahead to some things we haven't covered yet. 
All right, there are four domains of development. Okay, and it's still within the forces of biological, psychological, and sociocultural. So it's three forces, four domains. The four domains are physical, cognitive, personality, and social. Okay. Research in adult development is divided into quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative research is objective, it's generalizable, it's numbers based, it's deductive, it's based on statistics. Qualitative research is subjective, it's inductive, in other words, there's looser logical ties. Deductive A equals B, therefore, and B equals C, therefore A equals C. Hard logic. Inductive, soft logic based on what seems to be correlating and what seems to make sense. Not always generalizable, okay? It's often very specific and based on words, semantics, concepts, and understanding meaning and emotions okay so once the researcher has a research topic and a research question or hypothesis the next step is to decide on the research method what is the hypothesis it's a tentative assumption that needs to be investigated through research and possibly proved or disproved research methods Okay, the first research method is systematic observation of behavior. This may be naturalistic or structured. In naturalistic observation, we observe people in the wild, in their normal environments, such as in a mall. In structured observation, we observe people in a setting set up to investigate particular behavior, such as in a laboratory. Okay, so we've got systematic observation, then we've got self reports, which will be conducted through interviews and through questionnaires. Thirdly, we have psychological tests. These are standardized. What standardized here means is reliable, valid, has norms. Reliable here means the results are consistent over time. They don't change like fashions, although actually Probably quite a few of them do. Valid, meaning it measures what it's supposed to measure. It's not got logical mistakes. It's not being misinterpreted. It's not being mispresented. It's valid. Again, a, an ideal, not necessarily reality. And norms, statistical numbers that enable you to compare an individual with a group. For example, an average, a maximum, a minimum, a mean. A certain percentage, okay, a norm. Psychological tests are often highly problematic when applied across languages and cultures, and they are often only really valid when assessed within a particular culture. So they're useful, but they're not written in stone, okay. Right, general research designs. Experimental research. The researcher can control the variables that change the behavior being researched. An experimental and a control group are used. The control group, the experimental group is exposed to the variable and the control group is not. The independent variable causes change to other variables. The dependent variable changes because of or depending on other variables. I need to edit this. There are two problems with experimental research. One, it's limited by ethics. And two, it does not always apply so easily in real life. It is a little bit of an artificial situation. Negative, okay, correlation research. Okay, this has been used to great effect with looking at smoking and diet and things that affect huge populations. Uh, 
When you look at statistics, you can see if there's a correlation between two variables, such as single mothers and increased in inner crime, inner city crime rates in America. There is a correlation. Does this mean there's causality? We are not sure. Okay, there has to be other supporting evidence. For example, um, mothers may be reporting that their children are joining gangs and getting involved in criminal activities. But nonetheless, correlation can be very useful and very interesting for understanding patterns of social behavior. Okay, then we've got the case study. This is Oliver Sachs talking to a neurological patient. Okay, a case study is an in-depth study of a single person, family, event, or situation. It's often done using interviews, psychological tests, observations, and diaries. Case studies are fascinating and can give lots of wonderful insight, um, but they can be easily distorted by both the researcher and the experience of bias. They may lack hard evidence, they may not be easily generalized to larger samples. Finally, we have meta-analyses. So you have many, many studies, say, like, for example, on whether um, ivermectin works on COVID. But you don't know whether it does or not, because all the studies are giving you different answers. So you put all the studies together and you look at the data, you put it all together, you look at the data, you get a meta-analysis of the data. And that gives you more insight into, well, does this actually work or not? Okay, so you look at a single variable, ivermectin for COVID-19. Um, there is a problem with the variable is defined or measured differently by different researchers. For example, different researchers giving different dosages to patients with different degrees of severity of COVID may get very different answers to the outcomes, outcomes in the experiments. Data may also have been gathered differently by different researchers. Maybe they're measuring um, lung function, maybe they're measuring fevers, maybe they're measuring survival rates. Okay, there are three, we're looking at three research designs for studying adult development, longitudinal, cross-sectional, and sequential. Developmental psychologists want to understand the determinants or causes of development and the changes, the developmental changes that happen as people age and develop. But figuring out what is actually going on, how and why is complicated because people are complicated. So researchers have to design their research carefully. Okay, cross-sectional studies look at all ages at once. Longitudinal look at a few people over many years. Longitudinal and cross-sectional. And sequential design combines the two together. Okay. Longitudinal design is about studying a group of people for a long time. It's great for looking at issues of continuity versus discontinuity. It's expensive and a lot of work to follow up on the people. People start working out what the researcher wants and changing their answers to please the researcher. And the longer the experiment goes on, the better they get at it. The sample changes at time, over time, people who feel like they're not doing very well may drop out more than people who are in the test. So it's like, it's not neutral, okay? Just knowing they are being studied may cause people to change their behavior. If you know someone is measuring your weight, you will possibly go on a diet and start exercising. Cross-sectional design. You study different people at all different stages of aging all at once. So you look at a 10 year old, you look at 20 year old, a 30 year old, a 40 year old, a 50 year old and 60 year old, all at once. 
This saves time and money. The people don't have time to start modifying their responses and their behavior or dropping out. Okay. So you cut out. But it doesn't show how people change over time. This particular people, what was that 10 year old going to be like at the age of 16? It doesn't show with continuous or discontinuous change. And you're also comparing different people with one another. How do you know that the differences are actually because of age and not because of the history of technology, for example? Um, so this is called the cohort effect. We don't know if it's actually a cohort of historical people. Um, like for example, old people nowadays may not be good on computers. But that's not necessarily because of age, it's because they're part of a cohort that wasn't exposed to computers. Okay. What is a cohort? A cohort is a collection of people. Okay. In social sciences, we say a cohort is a collection of people who share an experience or characteristic over time. And we use this to define a group for the purposes of research. Birth cohorts, people born at the same time, educational cohorts like us. We are UNISA second year 2021. Okay. Or people who share the same experience, like we are survivors of COVID-19. We're part of that cohort. Okay, sequential design uses both cross-sectional and longitudinal designs at the same time. So they'll do a study in 2010, 2014, 2070. They'll look at cohort A at three ages, cohort B two ages, and cohort three one age. And then they've got data on that 20-year-old, uh, information about those 20-year-olds. They can see what's causing what, okay? Cross-cultural research. Cross-cultural research is rooted in basic psychological methodology. It's not different, but it is tricky. One of the goals of cross-cultural research is to discover principles that are universal to all cultures. Uh, for example, studies of facial expressions, looking for universal facial expressions for primary emotions. And we know that those are universal human facial expressions. In fact, some people have extended that to other species and said that other species use the same facial muscles for the same facial, for the same emotions. Okay, and to focus on both similarities and differences. Um, if you focus on differences, you get things like apartheid and colonialism, where people are valued differently and treated differently, which is obviously not good for society. It takes time, effort, and insight to understand other cultures. It's tricky if you're studying a culture that is not your own to understand it. Of course, if you're studying your own culture, you won't even see it because everything about it you take for granted. If there are language barriers, it becomes even harder. And this can break down communication, especially if the interviewer is also not very clear. Uh, many standard psychological tests may only be suitable for Westerners. Research ethics. Okay, these have evolved over time. But in general, the principles are that researchers have to abide by ethical guidelines created by professional bodies and get approval from the ethics committee before starting their research on people or animals. Some of the basic principles are that procedures should not harm the participants that they should give consent and that that consent should be informed. They should know what they're consenting to. Um, if there is a need for deception during the experiment, it needs to be explained to people after the experiment. And of course, confidentiality. And participants should be informed of the meaning of the research and the general findings of the research. Okay, so that is chapter one. We'll look at chapter two next. I'm still busy writing it. And I really hope this has helped. Okay.